Good evening, gentlemen and ladies. Where are the ladies? Ah, we don't have enough ladies. Nobody told me I was bringing your date. Ah, well, we are honored tonight uh, to hear from uh, Sid Cohen about our... Uh, <laughs> Um, the, the growth of our economic system uh, from, uh, uh, from imperialism to uh, neoliberalism. Uh, Let's uh, welcome our speaker. Yes, yay! Okay. has often spoken here, but uh, not as often as we might like here. Okay. Continue. Uh, before explaining imperialism and neoliberalism, we have to see what capitalism, capitalism really is. There, there's a, a relation between capital and labor. Capital purchases, purchases labor power, and labor produces commodities that capital sells for a profit. He gets his profit from the fact that out of the eight hours that labor works, labor only gets paid approximately about two hours. And that's um, maybe three hours at the most per day. And the rest is what they call surplus value. That is profit, is the meaning of surplus value. But the commodity is sold on the open market. Capital has to pay rent, has to pay rent, repair, of forces of production and other, other overhead expenses. Then the middleman, in other words, the retailers and the middlemen have to make a profit. If he has enough workers, he makes a very handsome profit. Let us say a capital produces Jews. But another company opens another factory All right, Ron. and there's open competition between these two capitalists. And that's what they call the so-called free market. But well, one of these capitalists wants to uh, compete and he wants to get bigger, so he goes to the bank and wants to borrow capital. The bank wants to see if he's solvent. To look at his books, before long the bankers wants to sit on the board of directors of the factory. If the factory goes big enough, Then we have the marriage of industrial capital, that is the shoemaker, and financial capital. If the shoe factory swallows enough factories, then we have monopoly. And monopoly is the basis of imperialism and super profits. He makes super profits by monopoly. The marriage between industrial and finance capital is what we call imperialism in the modern age. Of course, the factory has to compete with other countries. Not just in the United States, but all over the world. Then they have to have sources of leather, 
raw materials and cheap labor and markets. Since factories overproduce for their own market, and since labor can never buy back what they produce because they get, don't get paid enough, that's where profits come from. And the other fix of five or six hours that they don't get paid for what they for their labor, capital needs new markets. And from the foreign markets, imperialism produces super profits. The competition for foreign markets produces war. We have to remember. Von Clausewitz, Otto von Clausewitz, famous dictum. War is a continuation of policy by other means. Corporations have to get raw materials, have to build infrastructure, railroads, roads, poor airports, ports, telephone services, computers, troops to guard installations and weapons in a puppet government to keep masses in, in, in control, not in control. In a word, organs of, of uh, coercion. That's what troops are for, that's what police are for, and that's what jails and judges are for. The Commodore capitalists, that is, capitalists that work for the corporations in foreign countries, that, that, uh, that the imperialist power keeps in power is working for the imperialist countries. If the imperialist power brought, bought raw materials at world prices, pay the workers a living wage, and bought in goods for a reasonable and brought in go sold goods for a reasonable price, there would not be super profits. That's where super profits come from. We have to note that these imperial powers to compete for all these raw materials. Markets and cheap labor. That is the real cause of war. Imperialism, if it doesn't expand, it dies. The inner logic of capitalism, inherent capitalism, capitalism is not a stagnant system. It's dynamic. It goes through different stages just like every other material system. No such thing as crony capitalism. It also has interlocking directorates. If one looks at the internet, one can find how the CEO of one corporation sits on the board of other corporations and financial institutions and other conglomerates, then into government services. Our senators and congresspeople become lobbyists for the corporation. If we look at the Clinton cabinet, it's almost the rethread before Obama became president. He has to uh, be vetted, that is the president, by a bank, and uh, Obama was vetted by Goldman Sachs and by the Pritzker family of Chicago. 
he has never <clears throat> been a liberal or a progressive. They picked him to pacify minorities, and it worked. I'm going to sit down. I'll sit down and read it there. All right. Take the mic off. Take the mic off. Oh, okay. We're not. Sure. <clears throat> then why don't you get it? Yeah. Well, anyways, he had to be vetted by the uh, Bitzger family Your coffee's coming, honey. I'm making and the banks. So he went to Goldman Sachs. Like I said, he was never a liberal or a progressive. They picked him to pacify minorities, basically. That's why they picked him. And it worked. The U.S. came out of the Second World War as the hegemonic power in the world in the world economy. The war had lifted us out of the depression, the Great Depression. By the uh, needed effective demand in the form of endless orders for armaments and troops, real output rose by 65 percent between 1940 and 1944. Now that's not me talking, that's the Assistant Secretary of State, Dean Acheson. So by 1944, industrial production jumped by 90 percent at the immediate end of the war due to the destruction of the European, Japanese, economies. The U.S. accounted for over 60% of the world manufacturing output. The very, uh, the very fear of the top of the society as the war came to an end was that of a re recession, a permanent recession, a reversion to the pre-war situation in which domestic demand would be insu insufficient to absorb the enormous and growing potential of the economic surplus Dreaded, generated by the production system there by weeding the re renewable conditions of the economic st stagnation. In other words, they were scared that we'd go right back into the depression. That's what they were scared of. And the Assistant Secretary of State Dean Acheson declared in November 1944, before the Special Commissional Congressional Committee on the Post-War Economic Policy and Planning, that if the economy slipped back, where it was before the Second World War, it seemed clear that we're in for a real bad time so far as the country is concerned. We cannot go through another 10 years at the end of the, like at the end of the 20s. The beginning of the 30s and the stock, the stock economic crash, in other words, the Great Depression, without the most far-reaching consequences upon our economic and social system. Ashton made it clear that the difficulty was not that the economy suffered from lack of productive activity, but rather that it was too productive. When we look at the uh, problem of, of production, the U.S. had unlimited creative energy. The important thing is markets. 
post-war planners and industry and government move quickly to stabilize the system through the massive promotion of the sales effort in the form of corporate marketing revolution based in Madison Avenue and to the creation of a permanent warfare state. Let me get my papers. Get my Uh, to a permanent warfare state dedicated to the imperial control, imperial control of fighting the Cold War, with its headquarters in the Pentagon, the sales effort, and the military-industrial yeah. complexes constitute two main surplus absorption mechanism beyond capital cons competition, consumption, and investment in the U.S. economy. In the first quarter century after the Second World War, before the First World War, Germany had very few colonies, mostly in Africa. But, uh, but had to compete with Britain, France, Russia, India, Canada, India, Canada. In other words, Britain had Canada, had India, had the Caribbean islands, etc. France also had plenty of colonies. Russia had the vast colonies in the Caucasus. Poland and other spheres of influence. Then the U.S. had the Philippines, yes, Cuba, and other parts of Central America. The inter-imperialist rivalry set off the First World War, not the assassination of the uh, Duke of uh, Serbia the prince in Sarajevo. This caused, what caused World War I was the competition between Germany, who had just risen to power, and the other imperialist countries, like Britain, France, and the United States, and who wanted to get a share of that power. That's what the war was really about, the First World War. The capitalists became imperialist, like I said, in Germany, France, and other countries. The Netherlands, uh, Japan, and Belgium also had colonies. Spain, Portugal, Russia. It's in the very nature of capitalism, the countries overproduce commodities, which the uh, consumers cannot buy back because they're exploited. The work may be six or some hours for the capitalists and only two or three buy for themselves, so they cannot possibly buy back the commodities they produce. And also, we see that the imperialist countries need raw materials, they need labor, and they always need new markets. This is the cause of wars. If we look at the First and Second World War, we see Germany in the First World War. The reason it went to war was very down on the totem pole as far as uh, colonies. It only had colonies in Africa, and that's about it. And like I said, the other countries, the other imperialist powers, had plenty of colonies. So actually, that's the basic reason why they went to war. But then you had the Versailles Treaty, 
after the uh, First World War, and the Versailles Treaty wanted yes, uh, Germany to pay reparations back to the Allies. And that's why you had a great big depression in Germany. Germany had to print up money to pay reparations, and as a consequence, the inflation rose like crazy in Germany. People had to have wheelbarrows of money just to purchase bread or other necessities. So they had to pay this reparations to the Allied powers. And they had this inflationary period in the 1930s. And during that time, you had two different social developments because of the deep depression and deep inflation. You had communists on one side and you had social democrats on another side, and you had the government on another side. And the Nazis, of course, started to uh, <coughs> develop their ideas and so forth. They had uh, meetings and beer halls and places like that. And, they, uh, and what happened really was they had to get capital in order to have the Nazi party supported. And Goring, who's one of the heads of the Nazi party and a millionaire himself, invited a lot, all the uh, bankers and industrialists to his apartment. And the industrialists and the bankers said, are you going to really introduce socialism? He said, they, they, they told him, no, that's a ploy. What do we actually want to do? is enrich the capitalists, enrich you. You come to power and you have um, a marriage between government and capital, between bankers and between bankers and industrialists and the government. And that's what Mussolini calls fascism. That is the basis of fascism. And we seem to be going at, into that right here in the United States right now. That's what's happening in the United States. Now, like I said, the capitalists want, didn't want to get into a situation where they get back into the Great Depression. So they knew they had to keep producing armaments and more armaments in order to keep out of the Depression. That is the basis of the Cold War. Because if you look back to 1917, when they had the first war, after the First World War, the Communists came to power. And they were very fearful that the Communists might come to power like it did in Russia. So you had Churchill come over here after the war was over and give the Iron Curtain speech in which he's claimed there's a curtain drawn over the Soviet Union and we can't understand it and it's a danger to democracy. What they meant by democracy was actually capitalism. Yeah. Democracy is just a cold word for capitalism. That's all it really is. Uh, of course the Nazis had to find scapegoats. They found the communists, they found the Jews, Later on, they even found so, find some of the Social Democrats. And the Social Democrats, what happened with them is the Communists came to them and said, let's have a united front. Let's get together and stop Hitler. And the Social Democrats are really the left wing of the capitalist world. <coughs> Didn't want to make that arrangement. So it, it uh, backed down and actually supported Hitler in the, wrong, in the long run. That's what happened there. Of course, um, the USSR lost some 20 million people during the Second World War. 
and it had a policy that they they wanted to uh, bring into being in the Roosevelt area of the Second Front because Hitler attacked them after the so-called Stalin-Hitler Pact. So Hitler attacked them after a short period of time, and actually, actually that's what Churchill wanted them to do. He wanted both of them to fight each other, and then after the war was over, to pick up the pieces and control Russia, Germany, and the rest of the, uh, of the world, actually. That's what they were after. Of course, uh, they allied with the Soviet Union, Roosevelt allied with them, and Britain allied with them because they realized they actually couldn't defeat Hitler on their own, let's face it. If it wasn't for Russia, who lost some 20 million people, the Allies would have never won the war. They would have never won the war because Hitler controlled almost all of Europe. And he had the industrial capacity of all of Western Europe. And the United States had a uh, control, had a uh, cross the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean in order to get to that part of the world. And it would have a very hard time. Plus the U-2 bombs over Britain. They destroyed a lot of the uh, industry of Britain. Thank you, and they had to have a one lease from Roosevelt, and that took a long time. But finally, the Roosevelt said, okay, we'll loan you these weapons, but you have to pay us back after the war. So he loaned, us, he loaned them the weapons, and then, of course, the Allies came out as the victor. So, uh, as far as uh, neoliberalism, we have to look to that aspect because that's very interesting. And that is um, after the United States, especially around 1980 and around 1990 when the USSR and the Soviet bloc fell, what they wanted to do is privatize everything. So they uh, loaned big sums of money the different countries, let's say like Argentina, <coughs> Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, and a lot of these countries in Latin America, and they made a deal with them that we'll, buy, we'll loan you this money and we're going to help you industrialize. And the way we'll help you industrialize is to build infrastructure for you or build a telephone company, or roads, or a port, or something. And then what happened was, the, they, they loaned them the principal. But after a while, the principal, the interest, started going up like crazy. And they had to pay back the interest. And the interest came, on, came out almost as large as the principal. So that was a difficult time for them. And they used Chile as an example. They overthrew Allende in 1973, and they installed neoliberalism, where they super exploited these various countries in, in order to make super profits. That's the whole idea of it: is make super profits. And uh, if you look now at the United States, we're doing the same thing here. We're private, trying to privatize schools. They're trying to privatize the internet. They're trying to privatize almost everything. And the corporations and the bankers, what are they actually after? They're after super profits. And about 30% of the people in the United States live fairly good, I would say. But the other 70% are just barely getting by. And a lot of them become so disenchanted with this economy, a lot of them aren't even going to vote anymore. Because the super exploitation of neoliberalism 
has come to the fore. And we're running into a police state in the United States. We have privatized NSA, National Security Agency. You have privatized prisons. They're trying to privatize the schools. And what does this all amount to? It's nothing but fascism. That's all it amounts to. Fascism in the United States. And they put up candidates, Republican, I call them, and Democrats, Democrat, Demo rats. That's what I call them. That's what they're not interested in bringing progress. What they're interested is complete, total control of everything. And that would be fascism. Now, the only way I see to get out of this terrible dilemma is you could vote for whatever um, candidate that you want to vote for that you think is maybe a little progressive. I don't disagree with it. What we, what we need is grassroots organization. We need the different groups, like the Greens, the yeah. Blacks, the, the other, uh, the climate change people, almost every labor, almost every group coming together in a block and forming their own party, they represent the interest of the interest of the exploited of the United States and try to fight this. This is the only possible way I see of getting out of this dilemma. Thank you. All right. We'll entertain your questions here. Bill okay. Went? Yeah, uh, your presentation sounded like it's all a matter of bad intentions. It almost seems to me like uh, a Salem witchcraft trial. All you're saying is all these uh, fascists and imperialists and capitalists and so on have bad intentions and they're trying to exploit everybody and uh, they have some kind of evil demonic power and you didn't really get into how they do what they do. Um, the whole idea of capital is profits. If you look at everything in the United States, if you go to a doctor, if you get, go to get your car fixed, if you go to a dentist, if you, if you go to a hotel and you want to get into a hotel, what is the main thing they're interested in? Making a profit. Nothing is really dedicated to the welfare of the people. Now, we had struggles during the 1930s where you had different groups come together and you had them struggle for better conditions. And we won some of those better, better conditions under Roosevelt. But Roosevelt was a social democrat. He wanted to make sure that capital stood in power. And that's what happened. He didn't really solve the Depression. What solved the Depression was the Second World War. Up until 1937, this program helped quite a bit. I don't deny it. But what he called the Royalists sabotaged a lot of his programs. And if, and if he did win, what happened is the capitalists kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. More monopolized, monopolized, monopolized. And that's why you have about one hundredth of one percent in the United States controls almost everything. 856 people, according to the latest account, control half the wealth of the planet. <coughs> okay. All right, uh, Tracy. I have two questions. The first one, I think I'm asking a rhetorical question because I think I know what your answer is going to be. Um, why do they want super profits? 
because there's competition. If one capitalist doesn't get ahead, the other capitalist will swallow them up. And that's the nature of capitalism itself. It's built into capitalism. Either you get ahead or you die. Yeah. Like all empires, either you keep expanding or you die. It's part of the structure of capitalism. It has nothing to do with people, what they think. It's, it's in the DNA of capitalism <laughs> itself. It's part of the structure of capitalism. All right. Uh, I'll recognize Gene Horker. I said you spoke mainly about the United States and our capitalistic system. Uh, in your view and your understanding, are there other uh, country, a country or other countries that uh, have a better system than we do? Well, you have better systems, I would say, in the Scandinavian countries because they got social democracy. Now the reason they have social democracy, if you look at those countries, you'll find maybe 80 to 90 percent belong to unions. <laughs> and they put up quite a grassroots struggle in order to get those benefits. But capitalism itself is self-destructive. They need these markets, they need raw materials, and they need cheap labor to make super profits. So they go to war constantly. And then you have another problem, global warming. If capitalism keeps on going like it is, you won't have a planet after a while. Because mm -hmm. the uh, oceans are rising due to global warming. So capitalism as, as a system is, uh, it belongs to the ash can of history really. We've come through four different epochs. We had primitive communism, we had slavery, we had feudalism, and now we have capitalism. But capitalism is coming to the end of its road. And if we don't stop it, we're not going to have a planet any longer. Thank you. Yes, Tim Bolger. Sid, where have you been for the last 25 years? <laughs> Uh, there is a little something called the World Wide Web that came in that's literally impacted trends all over the world. Can you comment, please? Yes, uh, I think it's a very good development. And capitalism has a dynamic that is productive. You're right. But it's outlived its usefulness. Like I said, if we keep up with it, we won't have appointment. We, we're constantly at war. We're a warfare nation. You want to be constantly at war. You want to have global warming. You want people to die because they can't get health care. That's what's happening in the United States. And in um, Western Europe, it's a little better than here. But they still have capitalism. And they're still competing. But they can't compete with the United States because the United States produces 41% of all manufacturing as far as weapons are concerned. And we have 800 bases across the globe. So the, we're the number one imperialist power. And nobody can compete with us. But China is rising. And China has a hybrid system. And the reason it doesn't have depression there and recession and doesn't go to war because it has a hybrid economy and plans its economy. In other words, it's at the very beginning of socialism. Now socialism failed in the USSR because it tried to do too much as far as state control and it didn't have the economic infrastructure to do that. That's one of the biggest reasons it failed. All right, Bob Lichtenberg. Uh, Sid, could you uh, please summarize for us what your uh, overall thesis is? My overall thesis is we have social production, but individual appropriation. In other words, we're working for the one hundredth of one percent. 
and this can't keep going. So what we need is social production for people that produce the wealth. In other words, the workers and the people that contribute to the economy. Like they water? should run the economy. <coughs> and we're coming to that conclusion in a number of places. If we look at Seattle, for instance, we have a socialist mayor there. If you look at uh, Naomi Klein, she just wrote a book about global warming. And she realizes that if we keep having capitalism, we won't have a planet. It'll be, if, if there's such a word, it'll be planicide. We'll destroy the human race. So either we go forward, or we go into barbarism and the end of this planet. It's either one choice or the other. We don't have another choice. That's, a, that's the recognition of that particular necessity. And it's a necessity not for all, only for us, but the whole, um, for all the uh, animals of the world, all the plants of the world, all the food of the world. We won't be able to exist. It's a very dire situation. We're caught in a, a supreme contradiction. Either we change the system, or we do away with the planet. It's, it's an extreme thing, but it's happening. And we can't do nothing about it, unless we organize and try to change the system. All right. Oh. Wes Swagger, you have a question? Oh, all right, in that case. Uh, yeah, I got it. No, uh, Mike Lee. Sid, uh, thanks for bringing us up, all this stuff up. Um, you know, the uh, stimulus, the $4 trillion stimulus ended last week, where we were giving banks $80 billion a month, buying their bonds and giving them $80 yeah, billion. Yeah. You know, our government was printing money, giving it to the banks and the stockbrokers in New York. So that inflated the, uh, you know, too bad I don't have a healthy portfolio. You know, inflated everybody's yeah. portfolio, especially the one percent. So, and then I'm watching on PBS, the, the, I'll get to a question here. The, Frank, the Franklin Roosevelt, uh, uh, you know, his presidency, yeah. where there were works programs and infrastructure built. Yeah, yeah. And um, just, you know, all kinds of parks, what have you. Yeah, I remember. <coughs> would we the New been, Deal, in other words. Would we have been better off, instead of giving $4 trillion to um, banks and stockbrokers in New York, would we have been better off uh, five years ago to give that four trillion dollars to uh, you know yeah of course responsible work work program programs. yeah of course we would have been better off we would have went back to the um, uh, New Deal but at the same time we have a different situation than there in the 1930s you have only one hundred of one percent controlling maybe uh, almost all the economy and their families. And uh, I'll tell you what happened in Germany to understand the New Deal. Now, in about 1870, Karl Marx produced a paper called the News Zeitung. Zeitung is sort of like uh, the world, everything around you, I guess. If you want to... Uh, In the 1840s, it was the Neue Rheinische Zeitung. Okay. But what happened was that he developed this paper and he started getting a lot of people reading it and after a while they start the voting for the Social Democratic Party. And the ruling class Especially uh, around, he, he had a, eventually he got kicked out of Germany, he had to go to England. And uh, about 1880 or so, Otto von Bismarck came into power. No, Yeah, it was about 1880. Huh? He renounced his German citizenship, otherwise, he could have gone back to Germany anytime. But, <laughs> well, anyways, maybe I don't have the dates correctly, but 
Von uh, Bismarck put forth the social democratic vision like the New Deal. And a lot of the people that were voting for the communists went to the social democratic side. And social democracy is nothing but capitalism with some reforms in it. That's all it is. And it doesn't stop the capitalists from swallowing other capitalists and getting bigger. It's, a, it's really only a partial solution. It's a pragmatic solution. But in the long run, pragmatism doesn't really get the, to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is capitalism itself. If that answers your question. Well, uh, it certainly speaks to it. Uh, Neil? Yeah. Um, I thought the, the subject tonight was the origins of no, free uh, markets. He put it in there. I didn't put it in there. Oh, okay. Because I was. <laughs> uh, I didn't um, put that in. I'm, I'm a little confused about how you're using some of the words you use. You keep, you, you've said communist several times. It's, I, as far as I can tell, you specifically mean Bolshevik, the party that took over Russia. Yeah. But you've been also talking about social democrats, who I thought were simply more gradualist, less bloodthirsty Marxists. Um, can you can you clarify yes. the difference between what you're calling a social democrat and what you're calling a communist? Well, a Marxist or a communist doesn't want to reform capitalism. It wants to do away with capitalism and institute a system where the workers and the people that work for a living control the economy. Now, social democracy is what Roosevelt put in and what Otto von Bismarck put in. And the reason for that is to reform capitalism, not to do away with it. It's a form of putting off a, a qualitative change towards a different economic system. That's all it is. I don't know if that clears that up. Well, it clears up where you're at. Huh? It, it clears up where you're coming from. Thank yeah. you. Well, I think it's objective, too. Okay. Bill Wynn? Yeah. Uh, I can see a lot of Bismarckism in this economy. And I'd love to have some references on it. I've seen a few here and there, but uh, the only thing I can really recommend is uh, Bernard Semmel, uh book on uh, how Bismarckism was put across in the early 20th century. If you've got any other references, I'd love to, love to have them. Well, there, there, there's other references. If you look at Britain, France, Germany right now, they all have social democratic type of uh, governments. What I mean, I mean like books or articles. Oh, books or articles? Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, you probably have to look it up in the internet. I don't have an internet. And I don't have many books any longer because when I move to where I'm moving, I live in a nursing home and there's no room for anything. Oh, no. So I don't have the references. But if you want the references, you could look it up in the internet. Another thing you could look up in the internet that's very interesting well, uh, look up the various candidates that you think are progressive. That's okay. And you'll find most okay. of them get their, their funds from the same corporations and bankers that the Republicans get. Well, of course, I'm not including the uh, Koch brothers, but a lot of the other ones, like Goldman Sachs and, uh, sure. and the other banks and corporations like Boeing and... Um, and all the other cor uh, industrial corporations and iron corporations. Look it up in, your, in the internet and you see where the funds are coming from. That's the best thing you could do. Uh, Tracy. Um, I think you've done a splendid job explaining the nature of the problem and the phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, but I'm wondering if you have any ideas about what an alternative to those problems would be. Well, the alternative, like I said, would be the people that produce should control the economy. Now, 
we have to look at Russia. They say Russia failed. And it did to a certain degree. It had a command economy to try to plan everything. But if you understand socialism, real socialism, you have to understand that socialism has to have a very powerful economic base. And Russia never had that. Russia was the link, weakest link as far as the capitalist world was concerned in Europe. And that's why it broke first, because this is the weakest link. And Lenin, after a certain period, realized that, and he tried to introduce what he called NEP, New Economic Policy, where he, they would have a controlled capitalism in order to grow the economy to a certain point where the economy would be viable in order to support a complete social state, which we don't have anywhere in the world now. China. But China is working towards that goal. And it has a hybrid economy, but it's a planned hybrid economy. <laughs> if you look at the economic situation in China, uh, it's about one billion and a third population. And they have already brought out of, uh, brought out of poverty one third of their population. Now that's a tremendous feat. It's the second biggest world economy that we have right now. That is a tremendous feat. Uh, the development of socialism is an evolution. It's nothing uh, that you be accompanied uh, brought out or developed in one day or one year or 10 years or 20 years. It's an evolution like everything else. Everything in the world is evolution. Not only as far as we're concerned, but if you look at technology, it's evolution. If you look at the social, um, well, there's three forms of matter. There's physical, there's biological, and they're social. We're in the social part. Of it. And there will be an evolution that will take time that will slowly develop into a social, complete socialist economy. But it will take a long time. You cannot be utopian. You cannot assume that it will develop in one hour, one day, or all of a sudden it's communist and everything is perfect. That's ridiculous. The United States tried to overthrow the Soviet Union practically every day that it existed. It just had a tremendous uh, bad economic situation. It's very difficult. But China is trying to accomplish it. And I, I, I believe we're going to either go in two directions, either towards socialism or planicide the end of the human race and the end of the planet. That's the only way I could explain it. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, in a, you've pointed all these things out about capitalism, and you seem to be offering socialism as the uh, alternative. In fact, I think you said that uh, um, the choice is one or the other. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I would ask you, in a socialist system where the people who would be working <coughs> are just like in capitalism... What? I didn't hear you. I said in a socialist uh, uh, system, where the people would be the workers, just like in capitalism, they're the workers. Uh, I ask you, if there were to be a shortage um, of something, like let's say uh, a shortage of um, food, uh, who would do without eating? Would it be the workers, or would it be those representatives who are running the socialist system? Um, 
actually, if you have a socialist system, I mean a full socialist system, there wouldn't be no capitalists, and there wouldn't be no um, uh, two or three corporations controlling all the food, like you have in the United States, like uh, Cargill and Archer Daniels Midlands, and maybe two other corporations. The people would control the food, and as far as the ecology of the uh, of the earth, we have to manage that just like we manage, let's say, our health or something. We have to learn the science of growing food and not using chemicals and using natural uh, forms of developing our crops. Now, they're doing that right now in Cuba. And the reason is they couldn't get artificial fertilizers. So they had to use natural fertilizers. Not only that, but they're growing food inside the cities, on rooftops, in gardens, and things of that nature. So they're doing that right now. If we keep on going with our agriculture, our land will be depleted of all minerals and of all the natural things that are in the earth like the worms and so forth. We cannot keep going like we are. We're ruining the soil. And if you have a real social uh, economy, they'll be managing the soil. It'll be a real, um, what they call, I can't think of the name, a metabolism between people and the earth. We're both, we'd watch out for the earth, and the earth will feed us properly. You still didn't answer my question. In a nobody could nobody system, could nobody could tell what's in the future exactly. I didn't ask for a prediction. I said in a socialist system, yeah, where it is in the hands of managers. Who would be in the hand of men? Somebody's got to run the system. The it ain't going to be machines. The people themselves are run. In the, in the fully socialist economy, we're talking. Yeah, Not the collective now. state. Uh. Your straw man Neil. is not his responsibility. Thank you. My what? Your straw man is not his responsibility. How's he going to answer a hypothetical? Yeah, no hyper. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. There's no leaders who, in a collective. Who's right. our next questioner? Uh, Tim Bolger. Okay, Sid. I've seen capitalism work. Supply and demand. <coughs> free open market of prices. When there's a shortage of something, it, the goods come in. We've seen it with this thing, this laptop that I have. And you're going to tell me that a workers' cooperative is going to be more efficient than a corporation in providing these goods and services? Usually. Um, usually a corporation has to make a profit. Yes. And let's, uh, let's say that somebody has cancer and wants to get a pill for it. They have one type of pill. They'll charge you $1,000 for a pill. What sells is what's marketable. And it's not for the need of the people. It's for the need of a corporation to make a profit. But they have. I agree with you that capitalism was very progressive at a certain point. Very um, okay. dynamic at a certain point. I agree with you. And it brought us to a certain point where now it's become um, an albatross around our necks because it's producing global warming, it's producing the soil depletion, it's producing constant wars. We cannot keep going like it is. This system has outlived its usefulness, just like slavery outused its usefulness, just as feudalism outlived its usefulness. These were epochs in history, but these epochs are gone now, and we need a new epoch. Okay. Any 
told you. In that case, uh, <laughs> let's go into rebuttals. Move to rebuttals. And uh, Bill and once got one. How many here have rebuttals to make besides me? <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's uh, thank Sid for a, a good three. try and a good speech. We have exactly about, I'd say we can go five minutes each without much trouble, five or six minutes. All right. Five minutes each. Okay. Uh, beginning with, aha. Things are lag. Leslie King, are you going to do one of those? Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me. There's an old saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But all I've heard tonight, except for my comments, the questions, is uh, a cat and dog fight over intentions. And it's supposed uh -huh. to, it's all a big exercise, even on the part of the free market advocates. Uh, a question of intentions. Now, I've had some thoughts about this question for quite a few years, and uh, I've put quite a bit of thought into how do we get a handle on things, a question that wasn't answered. I've got two things I'd like to read here if I have the time. Uh, one is a statement by John Maynard Keynes. Lenin is said to have declared that the best way to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. By this method, they not only confiscate, but they... <coughs> yeah. You know... Let's put it on but, the stand. Come on. No, I, don't, I think I better hold it. It's yeah. not. Well, we dropped it about four times tonight. <laughs> yeah, but that's because it was that's in the seven hundred and fifty dollars, guys. I know. Did he drop it? Well, they confiscate secretly and unobserved. You're talking money. Yes. An important part of the wealth of their system, citizens. We're talking about the money. By this extent method. They not only confiscate, but they confiscate arbitrarily. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. The sight of the arbitrary rearrangement of wealth strikes not only at uh, security, but confiscates in the equity of confiscates in the equity of the existing distribution of wealth. Those to whom the system those who brings windfalls become profiteers where the object of hatred and the hard arose when the inflationism has impoverished as the confiscate as the inflation proceeds the process of wealth generation degenerates into a gamble and a lottery. Lenin was certainly right. There is no subtle no no subtle no sure means of overturning the existing basis of a society that has debauched the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic laws on a side of destruction and does it from a, a manner which not, not only One, not only one man in a million is able to diagnose 
the governments of Europe are rendering impossible the continuance of society and the economic system of the 19th century. Now, I've got a letter I wrote. I've just discovered this recently in the same pile of papers I've been going through. It's a letter to the Progressive from 1988. What would be the more radical, more drastic change in the late 20th century American society to fulfill the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto or to abolish them? First ask yourself how much they are have between have been fulfilled already, in particular the central bank and the income tax. Now we have an answer as to why bankers never lose, August 1988. And why neither Republicans nor Democrats nor even all the left-wing champions of social justice attack them. Or, at least, we are all well on the way. The answer eventually lies over the edge of the left-wing uh, intellectual world and the world of libertarian, hard money, free market, that's free, quote unquote, as in free elections, uh, thinking, or better yet, rethinking. Okay. Without the uh, despotic control over capital okay. sought by the ten planks, uh, in particular, the time central now. bank and the income tax. Okay. <laughs> I'll get that Brom. Brom, I'll get that. I guess I better not fool around with the mic. I don't have 750 bucks. Anyway, uh, I want to make a couple of comments as usual. I can't put them all together in a short time. My mind doesn't work that well. Uh, but the, the Nordic countries, I think I mentioned that before. I'll try to bring an article from the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, pretty much says the Nordic five Nordic countries are uh, capitalistic countries. On the other hand, uh, they rank very high in stuff uh, like uh, equal treatment of people and uh, uh, transparency and uh, just uh, equal distribution of wealth. I'll try to bring you a copy of that, a couple copies of that article. On the, uh, Sid mentioned the uh, hyperinflation in Germany. I think it was about 1923, and in a book called uh, A Force More Powerful by Ackerman and Duval, they have a very interesting section on how that uh, Germany got into that uh, hyperinflation. I'm tempted to talk about it, but I don't have enough time. So if you're interested, look up <laughs> A Force More Powerful, Ackerman and Duval. You don't have to read the whole book. It's in sections. You can read in, uh, one section at a time. Uh, on Moyer, uh, they had a guy named uh, Wolf. Now, I forget the first name. Now, I didn't touch that. I didn't touch it at all. Thing is, if you touch this, there's all the seven of them touch that. You want to come up and put the mic on? Yes. Hey, Charlie, I didn't do it. I didn't did it. it. Nobody should know how to touch this, because this well, is well, back. Just for you, we're not going to take your $3 the next time. This is the wrong thing for that. That's the wrong uh, 
Uh, Michael, we'll get it fixed. you got some tape? Anybody yeah, got any tape? I'll get it fixed. Anyway, I'll, I better not touch the, the thing. Okay, the final no, point I was going to make is a lawyer, this guy that. named Sorry. Wolf, was on there, uh, and he had a very good uh, analysis of capitalism. But I read his book, and frankly, I wasn't real impressed. It had to do with worker assisted, no, worker directed enterprises. Uh, I read the book, the answer didn't seem very good to me. Thank you. I read this. Yeah. Thanks, uh, and Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Sid talked about shoe companies and uh, manufacturing shoes, and that the thank you. Uh, Sid talked about shoe companies and uh, manufacturing shoes, and that uh, I thought there's a flaw in the theory. Uh, uh, the Florsheim Shoe Company outsourced in foreign countries. Uh, they quickly became competitors, and Florsheim went bust. Uh, Sid says workers can't buy the products they make, but everyone wears shoes, and all the countries who manufacture shoes, Spain, India, China, Mexico, and so on, their standard of living went up. If democracy is a code word for capitalism, then socialism is a code word for slavery. In 1929, a major depression came about. Many capitalists lost it all. Auburn Motors, of Indiana, for one, uh, many banks and investors. So capitalists themselves can lose, too. Uh, I just want to say that Winston Churchill said, the greatest vice of capitalism is the unequal distribution of wealth, yeah. while the greatest virtue of communism is the equal distribution of misery. Thank you. Redistribution. Bravo. 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 All right, I'm going next, Brom. Let me go next. Oh. No. No, I want to go next. <laughs> Tim Bolger. Sid, I liked your lecture. It was a good thing in theory. But something happened around 1990 that maybe you don't, aren't too much aware of. The world chose capitalism. They rejected communism. And the one thing that you guys may not understand about such fundamentals as the law of supply and demand, the law of free markets and pricing, the demands that are created by customers. You see, you have a lot more control than any of us realize. The world realistically is not controlled by the major corporations or the big banks or anything else. They're controlled by us. They are. We vote. We vote with our dollars every day. You're the one who chooses to go to Walmart. You're the one who chooses to go to Whole Foods. You're the one who chooses where these guys go in. Do some guys got more votes than me? Yes, Charlie, some do. <laughs> but you choose where you go. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you right now that we that this system has succeeded a heck of a lot more than what we've seen. Basically, said what you may not have realized in the last 25 years is we've had the equivalent of the Gutenberg printing press invented, and it's called the internet. 
And if many of you may not understand, but that whole fundamental structure of the internet with fiber optic cable, data centers, and most of the stuff, the fundamental research backbone was done by the United States government. A lot of the basic research in a lot of areas still is done by the US government. But they go out, they patent it, they commercialize it, and they run it, and it seems to be pretty efficient by the profit motive. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that uh, there's not abuse in the system, because there is. What the basic reality of the last recession was, was basically because of a relaxing of credit standards. People were lying about the valuation of an asset. And the bank lied. And, the, well, and, and like I said, the lie started with the guy giving a no-doc loan. That no doc loan was not verified. That no doc loan was then sold off to somebody who thought it was a good loan when it was actually a bad loan. And of course, a lie on top of a lie is eventually going to be a house of cards. The whole reason we had TARP and a lot of these other programs come in was there was a loss of trust amongst people and amongst businesses. When you see the commercial paper market collapse, which is basically what a corporation or a company will use for a credit card or whatever to finance their system, you have some real serious problems. Now, I don't particularly like the fact that the big banks were bailed out. I wish they would have gone bankrupt, but at the same time, they were so big that the ramifications could have been much more devastating than they were. I do advocate a good, strong, global capitalistic system, also with some good, sound business principles. When those principles are violated, we're going to have recessions. We're going to have things. And there will be people who will cheat. There will be people who will steal. You can't economically change human nature. But as far as the market system is concerned, we have seen just in the last 300 years a general rise in living standards worldwide. And even in the last 30, we've seen the rise of China, we've seen the rise of India. We're finally starting to see the connectivity and growth in Africa. To me, that tells us something that what is here works. Now, as far as saving the planet's concerned, I've sat here and talked about certain innovative technologies that will go. Andy's brought up things about wind and solar. Uh, I've talked about a new form of nuclear power that can do this. And like it or not, I think our world is essentially, compared to what it was in the early part of the 20th century, a little bit cleaner than it was way back then. And the problem with perpetual war, if you look on a per capita basis, there is a lot less violence today in the world than there was even 50 to 100 years ago. Me, I'm all for progress. You know, Andy, I'll back this up by data. I will back this up by data. Because that's essentially what's happening today. A lot of our economic decisions are driven by data and by supply and demand. And like it or not, the individual's gotten much more empowered in the last 20 to 25 years by the development of the internet and its, and its evolution. Huh? Charlie, I think you might be living in a cave if you can't understand what's happened around the world. Anyway, I think my time is up. Capitalism rules. We're going to hear about it next week. And the corporations, the big banks, and Wall Street will actually save us. Will you please read Adam Smith? I have. He's a son on the internet. I'm lucky. Wall Street will take care of us. It's my turn. He's turn on the internet. I'm like a god. Yeah, no, you know, I, I grew up to <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, We've heard from Cohen's point of view 
is uh, that the, uh, the Bolsheviks and uh, uh, Stalinists uh, were basically correct, but they didn't have the proper industrial foundation. But actually, you know, they struggled very hard to get their foundation and their one claim to fame for those who wanted to, to escape uh, the uh, problems of poverty under capitalism uh, was that they did industrialize. That was their claim to fame, and they they did it by the uh, Stakhanovite uh, and uh, really very barbarous methods. Uh, uh, millions of people were starved under Stalin, uh, particularly Ukrainians. And uh, millions of people were sent to uh, Siberia. Uh, the various Stalics uh, uh, in uh, Siberia and uh, the uh, the little uh, uh, what shall we call them? Uh, the, the, I've forgotten the Russian name for the the hospitals for the uh, insane insane. Uh, not how, well, yeah. That were operated uh, for uh, dissidents. <laughs> well, uh, and the, 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 there was a very onerous class system in uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, if you were a vagrant, and there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of vagrants, you got shipped off to Siberia or to labor camps here, there, the other place. Uh, their full employment e economy was not full employment because for large periods of time, uh, their operations of, you know, they didn't, the, the way to get ahead in the Soviet Union for a manager was to have lots of employees. And uh, therefore, uh, you, they wanted to have lots of employees, but they didn't have the kind of work or the training for that kind of work that was necessary uh, to, to productively employ them. So they had quotas uh, that were set. Uh, do capitalist institutions make quotas? Of course they do. Uh, they had state capitalism. And they, they set quotas. and. There would be large periods of time when people were unemployed employees. They they got a paycheck, but they weren't working. It was a very inefficient sort of system. Yeah, that's what. But there were efficiencies and inefficiencies. They, but basically, because they were organized enough and concerned enough with production, productivity, they did industrialize and come into uh, the 20th century, and they were able, with help from the United States during uh, World War II to defeat the German army, the Wehrmacht. They, they made great sacrifices uh, not to be 
uh, <laughs> killed uh, by the uh, the fascists, uh, and they they uh, liberated uh, or, or enslaved, as uh, depends on your point of view, okay. uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, let me say a little more. Uh, the, when it comes to the, <coughs> what socialism is or can be, it's a hope. Uh, there are, uh, yeah, Marx pointed out that there was a large growing class in, in capitalist society of proletarianized workers. They didn't own the tools of production. They uh, simply had to be wage laborers. And uh, that class was going to uh, have to liberate itself from an oppressive capitalist class. And class rule is oppressive. The capitalist class sets the rules for this society. It's not always wise. It's sometimes stupid. It makes mistakes. But, and it's not always evil. But it's humanly fallible and prejudiced for its own interests. And it's what time. it conceives as its own interests. All right. First round, baby. Yeah, Sid, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk and a talk which uh, sparks much uh, uh, discussion and, uh, in some cases, argument. There's so much to agree with in your talk and so much to disagree with in so little time. Since I'm a disagreeable person, I'll, I'll take that oh, emphasis. Uh, first of all, you, you talked about China being a hybrid system. I believe you used the word hybrid or combination. Uh, in point of fact, uh, all of the successful economies of the world are hybrids, including, of course, ours. Uh, we are uh, primarily free market capitalism, or we're also socialist. I've often said that the United States is, if not the most successful, one of the most successful socialist countries in the world. Many of our, our institutions are socialized. Our, our uh, education, our roads, uh, and our military, our police, fire, etc. And, and we could go on and on. Uh, but the major part of our economy is, is private, uh, and it tends to work fairly well. Uh, the Nordic countries, which we talk about, they're also hybrids. They're just a higher percent socialism and a smaller percent free market than we are. Uh, as a simple measure of, of relating which countries are more or less socialist and capitalist uh, is probably to look at the percentage of the economy which is controlled and spent by the government. And those statistics are generally pretty widely available. And the United States is kind of toward the low end, but not the lowest in terms of the percentage uh, spent by the government. And the Nordic countries are uh, toward the high end. Uh, I would say, in point of fact, and, and uh, get some disagreement or from the people in this room, the relatively good life that we lead now has a lot more to do with the uh, free market system that we've had over the years than to do with our government. Uh, the present problems which we see now, which I would consider uh, mostly being manifested in massive, massive inequality uh, of, of incomes, of wealth, of power and control and privilege, huge inequities. These, I think, are more to do with uh, our political system than to do with uh, our economic system, because our political system allows the control to be bought by the wealthy. And uh, what we need to do is to change this, to get the money out of politics. People control about citizens. 
a complaint about Citizens United and how this gives all this money, uh, allows all this money to be put in by corporations into the political system. It's true this happens, but the way to, 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 to solve this is not by uh, attempting to control the supply of money that goes into the political system and into campaigns, but to control the demand. The way to do that is to do things like make uh, most TV commercials uh, for political reasons illegal. Let, let the, let the uh, candidates talk to the people in various types of public forums and debates and so forth. Get rid of these damn commercials. I know that, that you know, then we'll have to go back to all of the Cialis and Tampon commercials instead of the political commercials, but what the heck, you know, we can live with that. Uh, and, and starting next Wednesday, we'll be back. We'll be back to the Cialis and the Tampon commercials. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> the political ones will, will be off the air. But yes, getting money out of politics, maybe term limits and some other controls uh, on, on who can hold office rather than the people who have the most money and have the ability to raise the most money uh, is uh, uh, representing us in government. Some of the things we need, we need a reform tax system uh, with much higher rates uh, at the high end, uh, getting rid of the regressive taxes, first of all the payroll tax, and the sales tax and adjust the income tax rates rates to bring in the revenue that is needed. Uh, get rid of um, most sales taxes except the ones we want to use to control uh, consumption, such as gas taxes, yep. maybe cigarette liquor taxes, things like, like that. Uh, and uh, also, there was a fellow here by the name of Rob Burns a year or more ago who talked about a one-time net worth tax. I think this is a good idea to try and get things a little bit back to where they should be. And possibly even a small ongoing net worth tax in, the, in addition uh, to an income tax. But this is a, you know, this is a topic which can take an entire evening's discussion. Thank you. Jane, bravo. Jane Adams. Yeah, I want to thank the uh, Sid. He did a nice job uh, reminding us of what history is and how the thing would. And, uh, but I'm here to talk about my man Budger. I, uh, I told him. She came back in May. Tim. Uh, Tim. Tim. Tim Bolger. Uh, and, and I'm doing this not so much to get at Tim Bolger, not so much that I ain't got that much to say, but I remember two people, and I say two because it's a little debate which one said it. They said Edmund Bush, Edmund Bush over in England. He said, you know, if you let things happen, lies being told, and you don't say nothing about it, the, the truthful person don't say nothing about it, then that's what you're going to get. And and that would be wrong. Now, my man came up here, Bojan come up and say the same thing that we've been hearing for 10 years. <laughs> and, they, and, and they said, with a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they'll say things like, Oh, it's bad loans. A bank got lost that money. You know, letting them people have the t uh, houses they couldn't pay for. How in the hell somebody from Inglewood go outdo somebody from Harvard and Yale? Give me a break, please. How many times do I got to follow Blake and remind, not but he ain't going to listen. I'm reminding y'all because y'all <laughs> memory going to come right back. Yeah. In the last five years, and this is the United States government doing this, which means this is just the tip of the iceberg, and it's just doing it for sure. But Bank of America, uh, 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 J.P. J. P. Morgan and Chase, City Corps, and others, and other banks have paid the government millions of millions of dollars because the government saying what I'm saying. What I'm going to say, and that is, the bank was the one giving away money because they could take what they give away and triple it 10, 15 times 
and put it on paper and put it on another paper and sell it. Now it was just a few, several weeks ago when the United States called uh, Bank of America. Bank of America and say, y'all gonna give me this million dollars, blah, 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 for five, and you're gonna give this to so and so and so. And even Illinois <coughs> got two million, if anybody read the paper, listen to the news, got two million that they gonna use to help people that can't afford uh, 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 houses and so forth, and they can do it. And where that money came? Came from the bank. Why did they come from the bank? Because the governor, the state department, private, uh, you know, uh, said that we gonna, because you knew that they loans that you were given was false. The people that was right now that said, I work here, that I make this much money, my name is so and so and so. That was all false. Yep. Now, I mentioned earlier, and, and uh, to somebody back there, I don't buy books because I'm old as the dude that wrote it. Now, I was here when the banks were doing that. I was here when I had co workers, uh, policemen, school teachers, <laughs> nurses, and they come over here again. Passed our card back in the mill diners, late 90s, passed our card. What? If you need some money, if you want to refinance your home, give me a call, give me a call. Now, who in the hell is they working for? The goddamn bank. How many times a, a, a friend come to you, they go out to the house and say, appraise the house and says, well, we're for $100. They go back, I mean, $100. No, not $100. What? What? Say, say, yeah, $100. Uh, fifty thousand, and they go back to the bank and tell the bank what the real price was. The bank said, "You don't come to work tomorrow, John. You stay at home." And they called up Billy and said, "I want you to take John's spot because I want you go out there, the house that work work uh, hundred thousand. You bring it back at two hundred thousand. Why would the bank have them to do that? Because the." 100,000 extras that they bring back, this is money, nothing, uh, uh, create money out of nothing. And you can take this money and kind of like accounts receivable, but they use bigger words, accounts receivable. You can put that on your books, 100,000, you can take that 100,000 and that represents 100,000. And in their case, they sold it. Is I making that up? No, it's in the paper all the time. It, Boys, you're gonna come up here and think y'all sleeping, and that y'all suffering from amnesia, and talking about some old people over in somewhere else tricking the bank. Give me a break. Congratulations! You just described exactly what I was trying to talk about. Hey, I draw. All right, our next speaker is Neil Rest. And pull him up, Gene. Just to be sure, I'll uh, start I, my own timer. Time yourself. That's the yeah. Thing. Careful with the mic. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think this is what they call a target-rich environment. <laughs> um, in this whole page load of, of buzzwords I've, I've got here, I think one of the I, I think the place I want to start is I can I can teach you contemporary economics in one sentence. You don't get tenure by telling the emperor he's naked. <laughs> that that basically accounts for for most of what's uh, what they call economics. You know, there, there's the uh, um, the joke about a, a an airplane load of, of economists that totally lost power and was nose diving into the into the ground, and nobody got excited because they knew that the rising demand for parachutes would would produce a corresponding rise in supply. <laughs> uh, let's see, inflation. The reason that there is so much hysteria <laughs> about inflation, whether there is any real inflation or not, we have effectively no, we have next to no inflation in the last several years and all kinds of screaming about, my God, we've got to be careful about inflation. And um, inflation makes dollars worth less. Inflation favors borrowers over lenders. And in certain strata, that's a crime against nature. Uh, and and uh, actually come to think, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if um, going
Goldman Sachs would be more freaked out by, by having uh, inflation than just discovering all their kids are, are gay or something. Um, <laughs> it, it, inflation is a potentially total attack on the concentration of wealth, and that's why it's an issue. Um, you know, no, people don't choose to buy at Walmart. Walmart drove everybody else out of business, so there's no other store to go to. And they cut wages so far that if you work for Walmart, you can't afford to shop anywhere else. Uh, the typical Walmart store is getting millions of dollars a year per store in government subsidy in things like giving the employees food stamps because they get paid so little that they qualify for food stamps. So having the choice of Walmart available is the result of a tax on the free market, not the success of the free market. Um, I suggest that people check out an organization primarily in Spain called Mondragon, like my dragon. Mondragon is a workers cooperative of 50,000 workers. It's all owned by the workers, it's all run by the workers, it's financed by the workers, it's organized by the workers, and today and for years, Mondragon is one of the most successful economic entities in Europe. Hmm. And I'm really not interested in theories that explain why that cannot be, because there it is. And uh, we probably share some hypotheses about why you've never heard of it. In, in my remaining couple of minutes, uh, I want to I want to talk about the um, basic paradox, the basic double think underlying the Cold War. You had the two superpowers, and at certain levels, there was a very precise symmetry, a very precise mirror image. One side said, they're evil, they're rotten, they want to destroy everything, they'll kill you, they are the only alternative. If you don't like us, you're stuck with them and you're screwed. And both sides were saying exactly the same thing. There is no alternative. It's not a coincidence that that was one of Margaret Thatcher's very, very favorite slogans. There is no alternative. And the so-called communists and the so-called capitalists were telling the same scare stories about each other. Now, Marxism, in fact, is the authoritarian right wing of socialism. It is not a synonym for socialism by any means. It is a fraction, a subset. Similarly, Bolshevism is the authoritarian right wing of Marxism. And if you know the story, I'm not sure how folkloric and how historic, about how the Bolsheviks got the name Bolshevik and the Mensheviks yeah. got the name Menshevik. Mm -hmm. It's the same. I mean, they're Marxists, so they're real good at manipulating parliamentary procedure. Uh -huh. Like, that's going to be your, your revolution. Um, and and the so, so, so then then well Stalin's a loony, but Leninism Trotskyism is way over on the authoritarian right wing of socialism. It is not representative. It is not synonymous. And when when the word communism is commonly used referring to the ghastly regime in Russia, that's deceitful. That is not factual. How's my time? You're at 627 right now. 627. I think that means I'm already over. Sorry about that. Um, that was... Uh, that was the biggest one. If it, I, I, any, anybody who says communist when they mean Bolshevik is going to get grief, at least for me. And if anybody else is has shares the eccentricity of being fact based, they'll be shooting at you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
thinks. Eisenhower is rolling in the <laughs> Said, thanks for a tremendous presentation. You nail it right on the head on the major issues. Um, as you mentioned in, in uh, Naomi Klein's book, this changes everything, is talking about using the climate problem, the climate change problem, to fix our broken economic system which is, in a for-profit driven system, you can produce things like a drug company that will make a bottle of medicine for ten dollars and sell it for a thousand. And if people can't pay, they die. I'd like to talk about a couple of wet dreams for a minute. <laughs> a capitalist wet dream right now is unfolding in Detroit. They're shutting off the water of people who can't pay. Uh, international workers from the uh, human rights organization were called in. They considered the for-profit driven water system in Detroit of shutting people's water off if they can't pay as an international crime against humanity. They haven't figured out yet, how, the capitalists haven't figured out yet how to put a meter on the air we breathe. Otherwise they'd say if you have enough money you just shut off your air and you die. That's capitalism. Going for profits where nothing else matters. There's a, another huge uh, for-profit <coughs> wet dream of capitalism unfolding in Afghanistan. Uh, 2.3 trillion dollars of our tax dollars are being spent each year to keep one troop on the ground in Afghanistan. If one troop on the ground in Afghanistan where if they took the same amount of money if we were using common sense rather than for-profit-driven for capitalism, you could bring that man home and give him a Harvard education and give away 43 hybrid cars to poor people that need a car to get back and forth to work to maintain their job. One troop in Afghanistan or a Harvard education and 43 hybrids. What's wrong with this picture of how our money is being spent by our for-profit capitalist system in America? Another red flag. 22 veterans a day, 8,000 a year, are committing suicide because they've been sucked into the profit-driven military-industrial complex under the myth that's spelled out in this flyer is one of the three big myths sold to us by our corporate profit-driven media that you're in the military, you're going to be fighting for freedom and justice and the American values and apple pie all over the world. Not so. They're slaughtering women and children and move them off the oil fields or wherever they're using depleted uranium weapons, dust dispersal, dispersal weapons, to render certain areas of the world uninhabitable for humans so you can set up automated pumping stations. Capitalism, the for-profit system, gave us the media-driven myth of the new Pearl Harbor, which was sold to us as an attack by 19 crazed Muslims on 9-11. The rest of the world, the other 95% of the people, have known about that since September 12th. But that myth is still being promoted by a for-profit driven media that's dominated by people that know to maintain their excessive high salaries, they can't speak the truth to the American people. Yeah. Uh, if you try yeah. to speak the truth on certain issues, you just get fired and blackballed. This, I've talked about it for seven years now, yeah. since 2007. Project Censored has been up and running for 37 years. It teaches journalism students how not to get fired and blackballed if you're going to be a journalist in America. Now, I, I keep running into journalists, people who claim they've worked in journalism in one form or another for 25 years, and they've never heard of Project Censored. That's either a, a symptom of how smooth the media corporate blackouts are, or we have people pretending that they can't see a single snowflake while they're standing in a blizzard. Standing in a blizzard and can't see a single snowflake anywhere. Upton Sinclair wrote in 1935 or so that it's hard to get a man, no, he said, yeah, it's, it's hard to get a man to understand a fact if his salary depends on him not understanding it. 
the ancient Chinese proverb is, you cannot wake up a man who is pretending to be asleep. Uh, this is what we have in America today. Our for-profit driven system, our capitalist system has given us in the media some of the highest paid, most brilliant intellectual prostitutes the human race has ever seen. Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Ann Coulter. Glenn Beck. These people can't believe the shit they're putting out, but they make it sound like common sense for the ordinary person, and they shape and mold public opinion. Americans live in a bubble of mythological ignorance. We still have people believing that 9-11 was done by Muslims. We still have a sizable amount of people believing in this country that we, we had or still have an AIDS epidemic when there was never any infectious AIDS epidemic. That's now been uh, out of Texas A&M, Patricia Goodson, healthcare worker, uh, researcher, published a 30-year summary of the whole entire myth of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And incidentally, what? See, uh, I just said there's people, I, I, I said it earlier, give me a minute, Tim, this is important. When you, when your own mythology does not allow uh, the consideration of facts that have been proven by thousands of people. You want to yell out or attack the speaker, kill the messenger. That's the old saying, kill the messenger rather than uh, deal with an unfortunate reality. Those three myths form the basis of a trillion dollar triangle. The myth of our soldiers fighting for freedom, the myth of 9-11, and the myth of the AIDS epidemic and the $400 billion that's been spent promoting that myth, letting sick people die with medicines that had no help at all, but huge profits of the for-profit system. We have a for-profit system, so the idea is to make as much money as you can off of sick people, the general public. These things are documented reality all over the world. And uh, if any of you uh, want information, don't attack me and yell out from the peanut gallery, well, that's obscene, or that's Andy's opinion. I'm not giving you any kind of opinion. I'm summarizing well, a massive right database, now. okay? So th this is what, this comment up here, this says a population that's gradually conditioned over time to believe a lie, when they hear the truth first, it sounds outrageous. Well, that's what we have in America. We've been conditioned over 30, 40 okay. years uh, that we believe in certain pieces nine, of mythology. Nine. Thank you. Running the college over here. Running the college like Bolshevik. <laughs> 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 are you, are you claiming that HIV doesn't exist? Or no. Yes. What's the HIV? Okay. Um, HIV is okay. Ready? Okay. So you're a second. My problem. Capitalism uh, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, profit uh, uh, motive, the profit arrangement uh, for allocating goods. The uh, <clears throat> The profit um, motivation of allocating goods is the most efficient uh, method uh, that was ever devised. Yes. And uh, you look at um, a country like uh, uh, like Russia uh, in the, uh, the uh, communist uh, time, the uh, <clears throat> you had uh, instead of the, the profit system. Uh, allocating uh, goods, uh, you had cronyism and corruption, okay? In China, you have the same thing, corruption uh, quite uh, widespread. And uh, that's what uh, communism uh, is uh, characterized by. I won't say it's inevitable, but it's characterized by that. And uh, <clears throat> capitalism has many flaws. Uh, I agree with the gentleman. But um, you look at the advantages and disadvantages, which is the only way to um, uh, crystallize your judgment here. And uh, <clears throat> you see that uh, capitalism uh, has uh, <clears throat> uh, many, many um, advantages uh, as far as allocating goods that communism doesn't. The gentleman uh, looks at Marxism, and uh, <clears throat> you look around the world, what countries are Marxists anymore? Uh, the system 
was judged to be um, not workable. And the gentleman uh, is living back in the 1920s with his thinking uh, that, uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, communism uh, is, is an explanation and, and a, uh, um, an elixir, a, um, a good result. Uh, and it's just not proven. It, it, you, don't, you can't point to any country. Cuba, perhaps, uh, is nominally communist, but uh, look at the uh, status of the Cubans as far as uh, development. Uh, I, uh, the gentleman uh, kept talking about super profits. I don't see any super profits. I see profits, yes. Uh, okay, but uh, well, yeah, but okay. One oh, spool at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the one interrupting. Really, you're out of order. Please. I would suggest that the uh, gentleman. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You, you have your hand up. Thank you. Yeah. The top ten highest paid fund managers on Wall Street take home as much money as two thirds of a million school teachers. That is obscene. Well, um, yes, but government uh, will regulate things like the antitrust. They regulated antitrust. You mean like Santa Claus? All right. There's no reason. Yeah. There's no reason why. Uh, Would you speak into the microphone, please? All right. There's there's no reason why uh, either a capitalist uh, solution to that problem would be. Um, that uh, the um, people that invest would find a more efficient method of, um, of uh, investing. Okay, that's one method. The second thing is that uh, you would have something like the SEC to regulate it, okay? But uh, you point out uh, problems and there are solutions. The people uh, like our own Senator uh, Durkin uh, has, uh, <coughs> looks at solutions and uh, he, is, uh, well, he is one of the real leaders in the Senate, okay? You, uh, <clears throat> you got red in, uh, around the, uh, the eyeballs uh, <clears throat> pointing out those things. There are injustices, but it, they're either self-correcting or they're correcting by uh, government uh, supervision. The SEC has uh, actually looked at uh, some of those uh, things you're talking about, and uh, <clears throat> there are hearings on the, on the Hill as to what can be done uh, about that. The problem is to get a Congress that is uh, not corrupted. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the big thing, uh, it, the enemy is not capitalism. It's a lobbyist that corrupt the system. That's your enemy. And uh, <clears throat> capitalism is, as I say, advantages and disadvantages. And you can look at all the disadvantages and um, say capitalism is no good, but you have to weigh things and determine the way to go that's the most efficient and the best for society. I agree with the gentleman. We're, we're going into a method. We're going into an area of the environment that is going to kill everything. I agree with that. But people are working on solutions. They're working on, okay, they're looking on such things as the carbon tax, etc. If you look, if you try to figure out solutions rather than getting your uh, eyeballs red, then that's the way to proceed. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. I'm a I'm a capitalist with an economics background, but I um. You know, I don't think Sid wanted to uh, rid ourselves of capitalism. I think it's just redistribution. It's ridiculous that uh, these these people on the one percent and the point one percent are making that much. Uh, that's criminal. Even a, a rounder sounds like a crook somehow. <laughs> My God. So, yeah. Um, you know, it seems to me that um, yeah. So so Sid is the social democrats. It's just, just the, the, t the tax on the high end should be the higher. We've been pounding away at that for for many years now. Uh, it seemed to me that it seemed to me that uh, the country economically ran better when there were higher taxes in the '90s with the Clintons, and then uh, in the '50s with the Eisenhowers. They had all high taxes. 
seemed like things ran and people were taken care of and and so forth. You know, uh, guys like Bush and Reagan cut taxes, and that ran up our debt quite a bit. And then, of course, the morons on Wall Street that just got four trillion dollars from yeah, the stimulus ran up the debt. dollars. Um, last thing I wanted to say on the taxes. Oh yeah, and then you know what? These redistribution countries like Norway, Sweden, and so forth, they have the highest living standards by far of any country. It's it's incredible. Just cost of living, services, and they redistribute like crazy. So it can't be that all that bad. Um, uh, I think the the CEOs and the boards of these um, you know bad companies they're not all bad, but you know all companies are bad, of course. Um, you like CEOs? They they get stock options. They're incentive to to run up their uh, you know profits and their margins and growth and all that stuff, so they make more money on the friggin' Wall Street. So that's their, their pay, their, their 20, 50 million dollar a year salaries is incentive to uh, be greedy. Um, so one last thing here, okay, I'm done with taxes. Um, the, there's a doctrine, I want to talk about war real quick. You know, I read somewhere that there's a doctrine now uh, about war, and we should be having oil companies and, you know, Halliburton's and Cheney want us to have perpetual wars, oil wars. So, you know, I was thinking about all the oil wars we've had. I think Egypt and Israel could be classified as that. Iraq, Iran probably is an oil war. Kuwait, Bush, is a war, Bush won the oil war, Bush two oil war, and now this ISIS thing, which will you know develop into another oil war. So I think it's just the American doctrine to uh, protect infrastructure and pipelines and, and oil in the Middle East. So we should be taxing the hell out of gasoline and oil and jet fuel since it's costing us a lot of money. Uh, last thing about, uh, another thing on uh, oil and war is climate change. Everybody thinks climate change is about now, but really it has nothing to do with now. It's, it's a way out in the future. It's 10 years from now, 50 what? years from now. It's not about now. It's about what's going to happen way down the line when we have two, billion, two million jets and two billion cars. And the, other, the, uh, the rest of the world has a lot. Don't worry about global warming? Well, no, I don't say don't worry about it, but everybody thinks it's about right now, and it has nothing to do with now. It has to do with the future. So whenever, whenever is a de if anybody's ever a de denier... What happens in the Arctic? Well, I don't know. The facts on there. I haven't seen pictures of <laughs> Anyway, I'm getting the bums rush here, so that's, that's about it. <laughs> There's no art at Ellie's Club. He says, don't worry. <laughs> you, can, you can row a canoe through, through the Arctic. Uh, oh, right, don't Pinnock. worry. That global warming won't be for decades. <laughs> well, All right, let's thank our like speaker. Today. Yeah, I'm with you, Sid. And uh, this debate's going on right now. And it's going to be decided next Tuesday, whether you like it or not. The two the differences between the two parties is pretty much what we've been talking about tonight. The one political party is all for business, and oh, they call themselves job creators. And the other people are the evil, evil regulators, uh, social engineering. Um, but I'm going to come on back and get, i got plenty here to work on here. Um, what, gives, what gives you the idea that the internet has somehow like changed the social fabric, the relationships? The internet has not changed social structure and relationships. All it means is I can get this instead of hard copy. I can get it, this magazine, on the computer. And some capitalist, in order to get it on the computer, wants like 10 bucks from me a month. And when I, it doesn't bring me any wealth. I said, well, what? Has the internet that made me richer? I don't know. I, I, 
tell me how much more. Since 1990, how much money I got because the internet was invented. You got a lot of publicity for the college of complexes, well, <laughs> a lot easier distribution I, for uh, I, 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 lots and lots of benefits. It has bought me no wealth, it's cost me money because I had to buy a computer from some guy and then I got to pay, I'm, I'm harnessed every month to pay for it. It's in fact cost me money. For what? Kitty videos and uh, let's see, what did I come across today? Celebrity Halloween costumes. Which you read in a tabloid anyway. <laughs> Which is what you would have been reading in a tabloid anyway, yeah, yeah, Charlie. Yeah, be quiet here. Now, I'm no apologist for Stalinism. Now, you, Bill, you said communism brought misery. I've, I've seen the coal miners in West Virginia and the field hands in California. And that's capitalism. And if you go to those guys, why don't you go to those men and tell them that, oh, capitalism, this will not cause you the misery that, who do you think caused their misery? Sir, have you ever been in a coal mine? Have you seen pictures of what goes on? Have you no idea, sir, what goes on in the fields? And you tell me capitalism has made life wonderful for these individuals? All the reason why we need thorium, what Charlie. Are you looking, why are you blind? And you tell me this is the best system that's ever been invented? One thing that I was thinking of here is that capitalism is so successful and functions so well, why are so many companies out of existence? Do you realize the college complexes is older than about 90% of the businesses in this city? Yes. Yes. What happened to no, them all? They went bankrupt. This efficient system. They went bankrupt and others now, replaced them. That's what I mean. This, the argument that's going on here, we can talk about the Stalins and the Bolsheviks. I like the Bolsheviks, by the way. But yes, the, that's the, the socialism that we're going to have here in America is unlike anything else in any other country. Is, is, it's not going to have any comparison to anything. It's going to be an American version, the way socialism has been. It already exists. It already exists in many fashions. There's all kinds of things about that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's a device. Um, anyhow, and allocating goods, uh, it's probably the worst system at all. <laughs> I, that, that, this amazes me. For an allocation of goods, he told you that one guy, 856 guys, have more <coughs> than the rest of the world combined, and you somebody gets up and says, this is a good system for allocating goods. And I go, what? <laughs> I couldn't think of one that's worse. <laughs> Our system, and you talk about facts. You, I mean, you want to inform from data, information. Yes. And it's it's like this is what I have to listen to. This is the best system we have for allocating goods and services. It is. Except, and oh, you get, you show me your dollar. One, one guy's got like a billion of them. <laughs> you ever heard of one man, one vote? That's what I like. Thanks a lot, kids. We'll hope to see you again. All right. Speaker gets the final rebuttal. Speaker gets the final rebuttal. The best system that can be devised. Come on. Yeah. Why don't you go in the coal mine and tell the guys that? Go up and say one thing real quick. No. Yeah. It's Sid's turn. All right, Sid, let's uh, wrap okay. it up. Give him a chance if you want. Why don't you put on television and get the same speech I made and the same rebuttals? This is such a free system. Why can't we have that? It's, it's already going to YouTube. That this is a free system. It's ridiculous. It'll it's be up on YouTube. It's free to exploit people. That's what it's free from. Uh, Brahms, Brahms brought out some things about the Soviet Union. It sounded just like the CIA and the State Department. 
word for word almost. As far as the Soviet Union is concerned, quiet, let me speak. As far as the Soviet Union is concerned, 14 capitalist countries invaded it the day he was born. We had 250 bases surrounding it. There wasn't a day that went by that we didn't try to sabotage it. And the same thing happened in Cuba and other countries. To talk about the United States like it's uh, the city on the hill or something, I want you to read a very good book. It's John Foster Doss and Alan Doss oh and their secret by Stephen <laughs> Kinzer. Did you find it? He goes in all the mechanisms. No. How we tried to overthrow countries. Yes. How we put up fascist dictatorships all around the world. This is a marvelous system. Yeah, you got to be joking. The only check that's missing. As far as uh, the Soviet Union is concerned, it done pretty good things considering sure. the stress and the aggression that it was under. Free education, free medical care. It wasn't the best in the world. But it was free. They, they used scientists, they brought up scientists, and they, in order to develop the country, some of the Americans that couldn't find jobs in the United States during the Depression went there to build up the country. The thing, the uh, misery that was under because of the capitalists surrounding it and trying to overthrow it, not one day went by that it didn't. Considering all that, it done a pretty good job. It feeded the Nazis. Somebody said that they got the money from the United States. The United States only gave them, gave them 5% as far as their uh, weaponry was concerned. They done it mostly on their own. And how could a country, given that short period of time of industrialization, defeat the Nazis? If it wasn't for the Soviet Union, we would be living under Nazi Germany right now.